Good afternoon. Okay, with a sign such as a round of applause, how has your day been so far? <laughs> Mike Mullen, you're slow. Let me, was that a good round you just gave me, buddy? Mike Mullen from UK? Okay, I'm just checking on you. Before we get started and I introduce the speaker, uh, I do want to tell you dinner will be served in about 45 minutes to an hour, uh, probably about an hour, so hang loose. You're probably not hungry, I would guess, after such a big lunch. Was that good, by the way? Thank you to the Marriott staff. What a, what a great, great dinner. And before we get started, my illustrious boss, Dr. Bob King, has lost his glasses it's in a black glass case, uh, probably left upstairs earlier today. So if you find it, discreetly walk it up front to the table and give to him so he will, uh, he will, he can't see, by the way. He didn't, he didn't know who I was for a second. Yeah. So if you find it, please let us know. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our dinner speaker. Uh, I've had the chance to really get to know him vicariously through a lot of the work that he has done in, in Florida. And you're going to be quite impressed. And he is someone who I will tell you that you want to get to know a little better and ask some detailed questions. He, uh, when it comes to student success, looking at analytics, looking at all the things that actually can move the dial, uh, this, this young man will be able to tell you some stuff. He's been involved in national and international academic issues for more than a quarter of a century, and he wanted to make sure that, that I said quarter of a century because he thought 25 years sounded way too long. During that time, he has provided leadership and insight into such important issues as accountability, student learning, improving retention and graduation rates, student satisfaction, satisfaction faculty evaluation, and training for the academic administration. And you know, in the state, we are pushing some of these metrics, as you all know, a little bit. But what he's able to do is to talk a little bit with you about how you can actually achieve those. But you can read the rest of his bio, but I want to tell you a little bit more about him. He loves saltwater fishing. Got out of high school and got a job at a machine shop. Never intended on going to college. He might have been able to get in anyway because he skipped a lot of class trying to be a commercial fisherman. He, he, he thought that somehow that he was going to get rich by doing that, and he didn't need college. But as he says here, thank God for open and rolling admissions. <laughs> you know, community colleges saved his life. He's also in the Miami-Dade Hall of Fame for graduates that made it good. So what we would like to do now is to welcome Dar uh, Dr. Larry Abel to the stage. We're looking forward to your conversation, sir. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for allowing me to participate with you today. It's been really interesting. I've enjoyed it a great deal. And always interested in learning more about improving retention and graduation. The, uh, when I saw that either Louisville or Kentucky was going to be in the championship, and it was the same night that I would be speaking to you, <laughs> the, uh, it reminded me and it struck me that this month, 40 years ago, I was uh, speaking in Monaco at the International Conference on Zoology. And it's, I mean, it was such a fancy conference. They had simultaneous translators in six languages. It was uh, in the auditorium in Monaco that the prince and princess had funded. It's incredible. And uh, I drew a kind of a late talk. I was 5 o'clock, and another guy was 5.30 on the last day. Well, at lunch, the coordinator comes in and says, I have great news. 
the prince and princess are hosting a reception at six. So I'm sitting up there in the front, and remember, um, well, 40 years ago, I was young. And I was very nervous. I was a postdoc at the time. I didn't have a job yet. And I'm concentrating, sitting up front about what I'm going to say. And I walk up, very formal, and you know, I had barred a sports coat and a tie. And there's these translators in back of me. I look out, and here's this 1,500 seat. And the guy speaking after me is there. A good friend of mine who didn't want to be there was there. And that was it. <laughs> and um, I'm speaking on the crabs and shrimps of the Panama Canal. <laughs> the guy next to me is speaking on the jellyfish of the Black Sea. So uh, I don't know what happened, but I, I, I got so nervous getting up there that about 10 sentences in, I said, look, no one really gives a blank about this. <laughs> And all six translators started looking at each other, <laughs> trying to figure out what they're going to do with this. So I'm so thankful to see you here. I really appreciate it. And I'll try not to get too much between uh, <laughs> you, dinner, and the game. So when I say multiple issues of retention and graduation, it's because there are a lot of things that we can do. And they, um, and they can be done in a variety of institutions. At Florida State University, we have about 31,000 undergraduates. About 6,300 freshmen come in every year and about 1,200 transfers. It is uh, not a lot of cities around it. Um, but it, I guess our students primarily come from South Florida. But many of the things I'm going to talk about tonight have been tried at Georgia State and Atlanta, completely different institutions successfully, um, San Diego State, uh, Arizona State, University of Florida. So what I was looking for is a way to avoid best practices that are personality and place dependent. So insofar as I could, each of the things that I'm going to talk about, I tried to turn into a randomized control trial. It's not always possible to do that. And I promise what I will not do is what happened to me two weeks ago at a federal meeting where they had an intern read 74 slides on new statutes. Drove me crazy. You would think that if we had this tattooed on every single, I'm really thinking about getting a paste on tattoo and putting it on the back of the wrist of every student. Because here we are in the middle of the recession, and the value of an education in terms of income and employment are huge. And you, can, you all know the stories, and they're absolutely true. It's even more important that we work on graduation and retention because of the incredibly difficult time that students who come from either lower socioeconomic backgrounds or whose parents don't have an education the probability of their graduating from college. So if you could be a straight A student, have whatever, 32, 34 ACT, and come from a family where neither parent finished high school or went to college, and you have about the same chance of graduating, about 15, 16%. And I think it's one of the most embarrassing things about higher education in the United States, that those students don't have a higher probability of success. You can read it in detail in Crossing the Finish Line by uh, Bill Bowen and others, and they've got all of the data up there. It's still embarrassing that it's only 60% for families whose parents both have a degree. And if you looked at it in socioeconomic status and by gender, it's even more dramatic. At the highest, the shift toward female-dominated universities is really driven by the daughters from the wealthiest families who attend college and graduate 45% higher than women from the lower socioeconomic groups and 8% higher than men in that high group. There is a fundamental shift going on in this country that I don't think is fully appreciated in terms of gender and educational attainment. 
part of it is this embarrassing graduation rate for public universities. Can you, you know, if you think about it, the uh, $30 billion in Pell Grants, $14.7 billion in tax credits, and we lose almost half of the students. The loss in human capital and finances is huge. If you use the Delta Project that uh, George Koo referred to, you're talking about $2.4 billion year after year lost in tuition and state support as a result of students who show up and then leave right away. Why in the world are graduation rates so low? Um, in Florida, for example, we're funded entirely on enrollment. And I could generate more income by having a high dropout rate than by keeping them in school. Because the state doesn't fund you if, if you are, quote, at capacity. So the, the way to be below capacity is to get those students out of there and reload. It's, it's a terrible, terrible system. You know, you look at these stupid rankings, and I'll back and forth here. Graduation retention give you 20%. You get the same amount for how much you pay your faculty. So student success, the most important metric that I can think of for universities is about the same as what you pay your faculty. It, it's ridiculous, and it's actually less than peer assessment. You know, and as a provost for 16 years, I filled out all those things. Can, can I name and understand 101 other universities? Hell no. You know, we made it up like everyone does. <laughs> There's also a very high turnover administrators. I, you will notice as we go on that I am obsessed with data measuring and accountability. Over 15 years, this never changed. 50% of provosts serving the United States were in office less than three years. You know, I was thinking the other day, after three years, it dawned on me one day when the faculty senate was just tearing me up, which they did a lot, um, over the library. That was the first time I realized I was responsible for funding the library. I thought it was a line item and the money just went there. Three years into the job, because as you know, if, and if you've been in that job, especially in a capital city, you're tied up with legislators and a million other things other than what you really need to be doing. I think the fundamental thing is, though, it's just not part of our culture. I went back and looked at 25 years of agendas of ACE, ASCU, APLU. None had a conference focused on graduation and retention. It's just, when you hear presidents, what do they brag about? Oh, our faculty just got a Nobel Prize. They have these grants, they do that. They hardly ever mention graduation and retention, probably because most of them aren't too good. The median, median graduation rate is 44%. So it's, it's just a not, not a good thing. However, what is good is there's a huge amount of variation. So this is. The x-axis is the retention, y-axis is graduation rate. The good thing is look at that huge amount of interinstitutional variation. So you can have two colleges with a 70% retention rate, one will graduate 20% of the students and one 55% of the students. Clearly institutions can affect retention and graduation. So how do you do it? The first thing that you have to have somebody to drive the system by personality or status. And every campus has someone who cares deeply about this. And if, if it's not the provost, the president of the provost can grant that person the power. I really think it helps to be slightly psychotic to do this. <laughs> and the reason is, it is very, very simple process. But it is a very difficult process. And my approach was to meet weekly. And every Friday at 2 o'clock, we met with a tight agenda for one hour. And the reason weekly, one, to emphasize that retention and graduation were important. Two, you would be amazed at how things can slip if you're not paying attention to it. 
uh, whether it's re registration or orientation, all of the things that happen on our campuses. So my idea was, I started out, there was just a small group, and I would say to um, admissions, you know, why don't we have more freshmen in housing? Well, housing doesn't want to do this. And so then I would stop the meeting, call housing. And you have to, they didn't really report to me at that time. And so you have to bluff a little bit because I know it's hard to believe we don't always play well together on a campus. You know, they don't call them divisions for nothing. <laughs> so I tried to think about everybody I could get together who had contact with students. We ended up with 37 people. And you say, well, what's the health center doing there? Well, if there is a flu epidemic, which happens, I want the health, the health center to notify the advisors of the list of students that they think are really ill. Because if any of them are on the borderline, probation or a 2.1, we want that advisor to intervene immediately, to look up that student's schedule, to let the faculty know what's going on, and to make plans to get that student back on track. And it might even be, if it goes on, that student's going to have to take an incomplete and start over. But it's important that we monitor it and know about it. So the, um, the other group that's real important to have on there is student government. Most campuses, student government have more money than you do. Think about student fees. Our student fees generate $12.2 million a year. And 19-year-olds are actually allocating that money. And you can often work with them <laughs> to get some of that money. The, uh, we started tutoring in the library, and whoever is talking about libraries, you're dead on. Libraries have just changed, and the, the function has changed, how students interact. And we had um, drop-in tutoring till 1 a.m. And student government thought this was outrageous. We were closing so early, going <laughs> 1 a.m. They actually then funded it to keep it open till 3 a.m. And they were very happy about it. So this is sort of a summary of drawing these people together. And where are the institutional research people here? Please, you've got to be here. You can't live without the institutional research people. I'm telling you. Because when you ask students, these are actually from the withdrawal slips. They, uh, I want to go live with my boyfriend in a Christian college in Texas. Um, <laughs> You know, you're not green enough. <laughs> if you want to be amused sometime, go to your withdrawal office and read the reasons that people withdraw. Of course, they're never going to tell you the truth. If you look at, you know, the ACT does these surveys every year uh, of universities, you know, affecting what affects dropout rate. And two things will really strike you about it. Three, actually. One is academics are only two out of the 12. And that's standardized test and GPA. All the rest are something else. The second thing is faculty, when they're interviewed on this, about 95% say it's the student's fault. That the institution and the faculty have no responsibility whatsoever. If the student did what they were supposed to, they would be fine. And the third is every year they ask, do you have a, what percent of a person or do you have a full-time person focused on retention and graduation. And the answer in 2009 was none reported a full-time person devoted to retention and graduation. <laughs> you know, I think about it. I mean, it's just unbelievable to me. It's not unbelievable because as a dean and a faculty member, I can't ever remember a conversation about graduation or retention. You know, I had lots of interactions with students. I had a big lab in biology. I had four or five undergraduates in there all the time. The only time we talked about graduation is where are you going to go to graduate school? It just, it's not part of our culture. And I don't know how to get it part of our culture. It's moving in that direction, but we don't know if it's just, you know, talking the talk or walking the walk. Because in 08, when the ACE surveyed chief academic officers, only 13% listed college completion in the top five. The one that Inside Higher Ed just did was over 70%. So we moved in that direction. 
you can also see it if you just do a web search. There have been 21 new organizations formed relating to the completion agenda since 2009. And I have to say I'm a little suspicious of some of them because there's a lot of money out there now um, in that arena. So where did we start? We started at a, you know, higher than the national average in retention, but I thought we could do better. And of course, as soon as I got involved, we drew it down about a percent. Uh, I don't know what we did, but whatever we did, it didn't work. A lot of meetings I went to and trying to understand it and talking to people, they would always talk about modeling the successful student. No Levitz had some models. Um, the uh, Aston, Tinta, they have models. And I, I decided to take a completely different approach. I was going to look at attrition tables. And this is what a typical attrition table looks like. In the first year, nationally, we lose 20% of the students. The next year, we lose 60% of that number, then 40% of that number, and it drops down. So over nine years, this is what it looks like. I guarantee if you take any university in the country and look at the whole student body, this is what it looks like. And so if you look at, this is white females from the upper half of income. And the reason that I have 10 years of data on there is I want to make sure that if I see a pattern, it's real, that it's just not one odd year. And you see, if you drop to the bottom, 11.7% lost the first year, 7.2 the second, 2.4 the third, one point, and so. That's why so many of us focus on first year programs. And in many ways, that's good to do so. However, let's look at Hispanic females from the lower income quartile. Completely different pattern. We're losing students in the second and even the third year as often as we are in the first. And you can see um, in the third and fourth year and back in the fifth, and so we have some students come back. That's when it drops below the line. That takes an entirely different strategy. And the strategy is to have a bilingual advisor. We require orientation. So we have a bilingual advisor, contact the student, contact the student's family, exchange phone numbers with the family, and tell the student, no matter what your family says, come to me first. We've had students wanting to drop out of college because their family needed $500. I mean, they're going to give up the equivalent of $8,000 of education for $500. We can find $500 if that's what it's going to take to keep the student in school. So, their strategies depend on what that attrition pattern looks like and where you can intervene. African American males from the bottom quartile income, same all over the map. And I'll mention, I'll talk about the care program that these students go into. And that is, you've got to stick with those students the entire time they're there. You can't, you know, do something for one year. I made so many mistakes at first that I'll mention later. You know, I brought in too small of a cohort. And the, the cohort would be first generation, full Pell eligible, and okay grades in high school. You know, Bs, C pluses, and um, we use SAT. SATs in the, you know, eight to 900 range, 850, which would be what in ACT, 16 or 17? So pretty low. Um, and at first we brought in 60, and it's too small a group on a large campus. Now it's 350. So we didn't have enough. Um, we turned many of our residence halls into living learning communities, and everyone uses the term slightly differently. Our term is we have classrooms in the residence hall. Everyone in that hall expresses the interest in the same major. There has to be two seminars a week in that topic in the hall and one class. So if a faculty group, like our College of Music, is obsessed with these, they want all of their students together, and they're willing. They now do almost a seminar every night and classes. So that's what we call living learning. Now, FIGs, I, some people call living learning. Those are our freshman interest groups. And as I said, I wanted to know about the effect of different actions that wouldn't be so personality or place dependent. So in the freshman interest groups, this is 25 students, and they take all of their classes, they say, let's say economics, they're all interested in economics. 
They take all of their classes together. They have a senior in economics who runs a weekly seminar for them, and that senior you know, meets with the students, has to go get outside speakers, does all sorts of, you know, talks about the economics honor society for undergraduates, all of the things to keep those students moving in the right direction. So we had so many requests the first year that we couldn't meet them all. So I said, well, this is a great opportunity to randomly assign. But the faculty committee said, oh, no, we're going to read those, sem those essays and make a decision. And I said, well, that's probably as good as random as we're going to get. So <laughs> you can see that you gained about 3%. And we already heard about this today, live on campus, same thing. We can't serve all students, so some subset of them are randomly assigned. Nothing is truly random because students who do things on time and early have an advantage, and that probably keeps them in school. But it moves them in the right direction. Now, I said I like data. What I asked every advisor to do was by time of day, by day of week, write down every single interaction with students. I mean, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. I don't care what it was. If a student just walked by and said hello, write it down. If they ask where they can find the restroom, write it down. When you look at time of day by day of week, you find that you're wasting a lot of human resources from about 8 to 10.45 or 11. The students aren't there. They don't come by there. And so I decided we did have some money at that time. This was you know, pre-08. So over five years, we added 40 advisors. And we trained them centrally. We have an Office of Undergraduate Studies. We trained them centrally. So we trained them in financial aid, all the registrar, all the general ed stuff. And then half of them we sent out to departments that, at that time, we had 500 students per advisor. And we wanted to get that down under 300. So we'd send them out, and the rest we put in the student union from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. We put them in the big classroom building and in the library nights and weekends. And, but I still had them record every interaction. And my um, goal for them, when I met with them, talked a lot about it, they attended our Friday meetings, was that they had to have 500 contacts a month. And they go, how is that possible? And I said, well, you'll see that because of these meetings and talking to advisors, we developed a sequence of activities tied to the academic calendar. So they could use, um, whether it's business objects or um, what's the essay, the PeopleSoft, intelligent, business intelligence, to sort of do quick programs. So if a student drops from a 4.0 to a 3.75, any .25 drop, Student gets an email, hey, how's it going? I noticed you had a little drop this term, everything going okay? Here, you know, remember, stop by, see if we can do anything. If it goes up the same, hey, congratulations, nice term, you know, keep it up. Is there anything we can do for you? So those, they can be automated, and then they have to call and follow up. The, uh, by this time, we were improving, but very, very slowly. And... You don't, it doesn't have to take you this long because you can learn from all the mistakes that others made. However, what we did on the Friday meetings and the value of these weekly meetings was every advisor, we tried to have frontline people there. Every advisor would say, you know, they're still not, you know, declaring a major. So by um, the first week in February, I would turn and say, Megan,